I've fallen and I can't get up. Fallen Titans is a series that I have a weird relationship with. Back in 2017, when I first started to blow up, I was known mostly as a drama YouTuber. I would do videos about YouTubers with big names and big search results, and I would draw in the clicks from those audiences, be it fans of those guys or people who wanted to justify hating those guys. And one day I had this idea where I could do a video instead about YouTube channels that I used to watch when I was a kid. And so I started writing it. It started off at 10 pages, and then it was 20 pages, and then it was 60 pages, and by 2018 I had decided to make it its own standalone series. Specifically, I wanted it to be a 15 episode series covering every notable forgotten YouTuber I could think of, and in chronological order. We'd start with Ray Liam Johnson, and then the final episode would be about Leafy is Here. But then there'd be a bonus episode about regular celebrities who started off as YouTubers, and then that'd be it. I'd just stop doing the show. But as I continued to do YouTube over the years, it quickly became apparent that Fallen Titans was my flagship series. Whenever I would do a video for that show, it would do crazy well, and all my other content would then do okay, just by association. And I sort of realized that if at any point I ended the series, it could potentially be the death of my channel, even if it wasn't making me happy to keep doing it anymore. It's probably not a good idea to ever talk about this, ever, like ever, 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 but uh, a couple years ago, I was hashtag cancelled by the commentary community for uh, saying that Ben Shapiro is bad? and saying that, um, I said transphobes should, should fuck off and unsubscribe. Oh yeah, and then there was like a thing with a monkey. Basically, I said a series of hot takes which were extraordinarily controversial for the five whole months between when I said them and when everyone else started saying them. In the aftermath of this, my comment section, my Twitter, every place was flooded with these pre-programmed fans repeating the same things every single day. You're a fallen titan now, Quentin. Make Quentin reviews fallen titans. And after a while, this really started to bother me. And it wasn't the implication that I had fallen, because I really didn't give a shit about that. What bothered me was that I never got to the point where I started feeling like a titan. I always just felt like a guy. Like, you understand that the implication of calling me a fallen titan is that at some point there must have been like a one week period where I went from guy to titan and then immediately to fallen titan. Why did no one tell me? I would have had friends over or something. But it was too late. I had missed my window. I am become fallenist of titans. Anyways, this actually turned out to be a good thing in my opinion. Officially being declared a fallen titan by the cast of Johnny Test made me sit down and really reevaluate this series. What I thought it meant to be an ex-titan, and more importantly, what I wanted it to mean. You see, I believe that Fallen Titans has accidentally pushed one of the worst aspects of YouTuber culture. The obsession with power for the sake of power, and worshipping power and influence as the soul-defining aspects of what makes your content worthwhile and relevant. Or maybe that's reading a little bit too far into it. Maybe Fallen Titans is still what I intended it to be back when I first started working on it in 2017. A simple video series looking back at old YouTube channels I used to watch when I was a kid. But if that's the case, isn't that a little bit unfair? Here's the honest to god truth about a good amount of Fallen Titans episodes. When I cover the content, it's not about the creators. It's about me. I didn't make a video about Asdef movie because the show sort of being unfunny is in any way relevant to the modern world. I did it 
because it represents to me an earlier version of myself who I don't like, and I want to cathartically shit-talk in an indirect way. And when I really sit down to think about what I don't love about my current content, I think about the fact that it's a little unfair that I spend my career digging through the dumpsters of all these other creators when I haven't done the same thing for myself. And why? Because I wasn't famous when I was younger? Because I'm still not famous right now? That's not an excuse. There are no fallen titans. It's not a real thing. It's a random term I made up, named after a legend that was so lame that it got retconned over by more interesting legends that people actually care about. Fallen titans is a nebulous term. No one is a fallen titan, and thus anyone can be a fallen titan if I decide it that week. Basically, this is going to be an exploration into some of the things that I made before I did YouTube, back when I had dreams and aspirations. This material is going to start off when I was a kid, and it's going to end with my graduation from high school, when I made the true great mistake that turned me into a fallen titan. When I began uploading my content to YouTube. <laughs> Checking. Hello. Thank you. Uh, uh, sweetheart. He needs help or something. I'm gonna hold him. I'm just. He's getting kind of aggravated. He's so cute. Oh wow. No, why didn't Zoe turn the auto focus on? It's Goes out of focus. All right, we're rolling. Say hi. Say hi to everybody. How old are we, Mommy? Four months exactly tomorrow. Four months exactly tomorrow. And this is Quentin O'Hiley. It's the first time Daddy's got off the sorry butt to put us on film. Come along. Hi. You're the bully. You're the bully. You're starting to get sleepy. <laughs> he loves his butt. Like the bunny. Like the bunny. Uh, good bunny. Hey, look at the bunny web. We're not quite camera ready yet, are we? It's okay. It's okay. See the camera edge, Tim Brown. So, a little bit of essential Quentin lore that I don't really talk about a lot on the channel. Before I was born, my dad spent several years creating a series of amateur home movies starring him and his friends. This quickly became his favorite pastime, and I would argue one of the strongest passions of his entire life. After he started having kids, he couldn't exactly keep the hobby hidden from us, so he started making edits of his movies which were supposedly appropriate for children, so we could watch those. As a kid, I grew up knowing these films inside and out. I saw them as exciting character adventures, which covered every genre of exciting fiction that I could think of. Undeniably, a lot of my interests in fiction today stem a little bit at least from these corny 90s home movies that literally no one but me has seen, to the point that I often fantasize about being given the chance to readapt them for mainstream audiences. One thing I have started to notice as an adult is that there's the very slightest chance that my father's personal, ideological, and political views subtly found themselves slipping into the characters and world that I was being presented. Alright, I'm taking over. I want all your property. Well, why the hell why should, should we give you all our property? property? Because I will kill you if you do not. Very good reason. There you go! Anarchy, abolish property, take it all, destroy the state, could they talk? But the biggest lesson that I learned from these films is that there is no litmus test for who can make a movie. All you need is a camera and imagination and a stupid amount of free time to invest into a project that five people in the world will ever end up caring about. By the time I was nine, I had taught myself to video edit by hooking several VCRs into one another. While most kids were playing their Pokemans and their Digi Dudes, I was firmly in the belief that if I didn't create a cinematic masterpiece by the time I was 11, I would be failing my father's lineage. 
In preparation for this video, I went back to my family home and basically started looking through as many VHS tapes as I could, trying to find some of those early creations I put together. This turned out to be very strange, as it was basically me rediscovering archives of my state of mind during puberty. Yeah, so I'm going through some of these tapes, and uh, about half of them are really important things, and then the other half of the tapes will just be me dubbing off every shoop de woop video I can find. Uh, these are historical artifacts that should be preserved. Uh, I wonder, it's, I imagine some of these you can't find anymore, so I, I've got some lost media on this VHS tape. Uh, this is, uh, one of my snuff films. Oh my god, look what I found. Get, get on there. You gotta do that, guys. Head over to 4 and I did indeed find a lot of my early work. Most of it just passively unwatchable and impossible to explain. For instance, this movie you're watching right now is supposed to be set in space. In the film, I'm also supposed to be fighting an evil version of myself, but both of us wear the same outfit, so it's impossible to tell if you're watching the evil Quentin or the good Quentin. Basically, while most of these things were neat to rediscover, it's hard to present them to an audience. But after randomly grabbing more VHS tapes that seemed like they might be important, I finally found the one holy grail which I had been specifically looking for this entire time. Lizard Men and Dragons, Part 1. Lizard Men and Dragons was my first film, the first time I created a narrative through video. It's the true origin of what eventually led to me having a YouTube channel, and it was also one of the only things I was truly proud of for some time. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll join me in taking in my true soul magnum opus. Uh, hi, uh, so you guys know me, I'm Quentin, uh, this is Jared Evans. Uh, yep. Jared Evans was my best friend, my childhood best friend. More than that, I want to say, what's notable about Jared is for the longest time, I think he was my only friend. Uh, Jared is also the person who worked with me to create my very first movie. So this is a little embarrassing. Uh, this is not like a first date admittance. But when we were kids, our mothers used to dress us up and take us to Renaissance fairs. Yep. So, oh, yeah. so we were really into like medieval culture. The tights. You know, we loved <laughs> the tights. Mom always had me wear those like skirts, right? Do you remember that? Yep. And I was tunics. I was, tunics. tunics. Yeah, yeah. And they went out of the way to convince us, like, no, they're they're not girls' skirts. No. They're tunics for they're men. Manly men. Manly, tights. manly. Especially my uh, bright red and bright or <laughs> yeah. dark green tights. Very manly. Yeah. Hold it still. What is that? It's a fire truck! I think that is a fire truck. So the point is, like, we were really into medieval stuff. And we had, like, strong opinions about all the different thematic aspects that we would be taught. One thing we had really strong opinions on was dragons. Because we had grown up understanding like all the Hollywood depictions of dragons would be like the, you know, like the Disney giant dragon fighting the night. Mm. We agreed that like, what would actually happen is that the dragons would not be actively malicious in any way. They would be like bees is what we decided. Yeah. If you fuck with them, you're gonna lose. But if you leave them alone, like your life will not be affected. And so continuously annoyed by the Hollywood archetype of the knight standing up to the dragon, we wanted to make a, mo a movie about just like lampooning that archetype and creating like a story about how the knights are stupid, the dragons would not hurt people if they didn't have to, and the knights would immediately get their asses kicked. Yep. A lot of this movie, I've watched it already, he hasn't. A lot of this movie is the dragon is just beating the shit out of the lizard men. And there's like, it seems like there's no point, but that was funny to us. Just the idea of the knights just sucking at fighting the dragons, because of course they would, they would, right? Yeah. We could like, scoot a little this way, or a little, 
Oh no, like the other way. Oh. I, oh. I wasn't wanting us to oh. get closer together. Oh. I was like, we're not centered. Here, go oh. a little this way. Okay. Uh, you should see the movie of the, what was it called again? Well, here comes the movie. Dragons and Lizard Men, part one. Scary. Oh yeah, that works okay. I already want to die. I'm recording. Hold on, I got something super funny. I'm from Burbank. Is that what we skipped? What's that? What's that? Can you explain me? Can you explain that to me? Burbank. Can you know? Like, like what? Burbank. Can you explain the joke though? Do you know what? Because you, you preface that by saying, I've got something to say that's super funny. And then it's just, I'm from Burbank. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. They write themselves. <laughs> I'm from Burbank. Okay, Gia, just hold the dragon here. Now, I'm the cameraman now. Just hold the dragon there. I'm Ice Rocks. Sorry, I'm from Burbank. Now. You see, mm. you're insisting. You're insisting it's funny. You see, you're, so, you're sticking with it. Yeah, you, you gotta stick the landing. <laughs> you, I am the Dark Lord, you shall fear me. Oh, I felt that it was fine. Use the plan. <laughs> Yo, Jim, quit. Uh, this, I feel like we're being watched, but here's the plan. Apparently, they've been at war with the dragons. Yep. For, I don't know, like dozens of, of years, uh, probably centuries or something like that, and they just keep getting their asses kicked, and they're like, we have a plan this time to defeat the dragons, yeah. and we're gonna go do it. And that was the point of that scene, and this yep. is the scene where they're attacking the dragons for the first time. Onward to dragons! <sighs> yeah, yeah. So, um, that's the greatest thing I've ever made. <laughs> there's, no t there's no top in that, right? <laughs> What better way to introduce the start of a battle than that? Just, just, just throw it, just right? Just fucking throw it. Just throw it. They fly now. They, they fly now. Onward to dragons! I just want to point out as well. You know, we got. There's a little Garfield on the floor. Right yeah, I there. see that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is right. that? I, 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 I still have that. It's, it's sitting on this table. It's, it's like. There you go, it's, I still got it. He remembers the first Lizardman War. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's seen a survivor. It, he's seen it all. Go! <laughs> uh, I especially like our dedication to assets and everything. Uh, the the uh, lizard men uh, being equipped with the finest of weaponry, uh, <laughs> yeah. which is just pipe cleaners wrapped around. <laughs> <laughs> what I've noticed is um, we we signed all the dragons' personalities. Yep. But we did. But the lizard men were interchangeable to us. So there are scenes in this movie where like a certain lizard man will get hit, and then he'll like have a scene after that where he lands, and it's like a different toy. <laughs> Moshi, Moshi. Oh boy. <laughs> Uh, aren't aren't you uh, aren't you glad aren't you aren't you glad I don't talk like that anymore? <laughs> this is the dragon. This is the dragon side. Yep. You can't run from me. I'll find you. Yep. Yeah, I will. Oh, there you are. Come back here, you. The screenwriting is top notch. Yeah, that we're making up on the spot. Oh yeah. Uh, so this next scene is what I remember thinking was like the magnum opus of the whole film. I think I agree. And this is the hell sequence. The sequence where one of yep. the characters goes to hell. I shall defeat you. I shall kick you into the depths of hell. What? No! Inappropriate response. Different Lizardman problem. <laughs> Hi. This must be the depths of hell he was talking about. Hi. This place sucks. He said I should meet my inner self. You must be my inner self. I'm not. You must be thinking of someone else. 
I actually like that joke. <laughs> and it was you your must joke. be thinking of something else. <laughs> yeah, are you my inner self? No. <laughs> no. No. What, what, what are you talking about, man? Do you know what I remember? In the first edit of this movie, mm -hmm. that joke isn't in there. I, before we filmed, I was like, I want this to be a comedy and also like an action movie. So you handle all the action stuff and I handle the comedy. And I remember being bitter that you had thought of all the funny jokes. <laughs> And I think that's why that joke was cut out of the like first Like Burbank. Yeah. I shall defeat you like I used to. Not again. Bling! Okay. Je je jealous, of, uh, jealous of my writing, right? <laughs> yeah, jealous of your just comedic jealous timing. Of my timing. I mean... <clears throat> Ping! Someone's <laughs> falling in! Watch you! Where the hell am I? Exactly! You and hell! Stop quoting. Do you hear my mom? <laughs> Do you hear my mom yelling at me in the background for cursing? <laughs> for, cur for saying hell? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember giving you a copy of the movie, and then you told me at some point, like, I've, I've never watched it because we say bad words. And it was just because I say hell twice. But that's... that's... kids using them H-E-L-L -L words. <laughs> you shall be defeated, you measly dragon. Not today. Boom. Okay. Wait, oh. did, wait, did we go back, or was that... It's a two? different scene. It was a different lizardman. It's the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's that close up of our main character. When I, after I say my lines, zoom it in his mouth. You shall die. I shall eat you like the rest of it. Bye! The only reason I remember us having that like philosophical dragon discussion is because yep, yep. I, I remember yep. shooting that and then you being like, doesn't doesn't that contradict the whole point? That's weird. That's actually. Just, I was just about to ask that. Like, yeah. doesn't like <laughs> if the point of the movie is that the dragons are like bees, and if you leave them alone, then how come we occasionally show the dragons as like enjoying violence? And the answer is, uh, we they're were, not bees. They're wasps. The answer is, we were nine. We didn't have the foresight to be consistent, and we just wanted to like throw toys at a wall. Yeah. It's time to shoot the credits. This movie was made by. I did by Quentin Hoover. Dragons directed by Jared Evans. Yeah, we're gonna find out who what the dragons were named because we had names for the dragons, but none of the lizardmen. At, at the end of the movie. Yeah, we put them at the end so you would know. These, these are gonna be a lovable cast it's, character. It's not. It's not about. Yeah. Their names. It's about their condition. Yeah. My name's um. Clamarin. Ice rocks. Ironclad. Hey, I don't like the camera! Oh man, if only we that had a, that... That's character traits. If, if only we had had that thought about every character in the movie. What? I don't like... So we just want to make the movie. That's the joke I'm trying to make. <laughs> <laughs> and that dude called Quentin, I pity you if you know him. Are we sure we were friends? Uh, you see, there's a lot of drama in the filming of all these movies. Yeah. I shall be torn in, in Lizard Men and Dragons, part two. Oh shit. Oh. Oh. Yeah, okay. the, this was always called Lizard Men and Dragons part one. Yep. Because uh, in my head, it was only worth doing these movies if we set up a if franchise. If it was an anthology. There's like a blooper where, which you can actually hear in the movie, uh, and in the blooper, you were disagreeing over whether or not we should put an idea into the movie. And I'm like, we'll just put in the sequel. Shut up, man. <laughs> that he survived what he was attacked by. We can do that in the next movie. Oh. I just did it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was my seventh grade that we like did the last official, yeah. like we shot something for this franchise. But we were like, we were still kind of into doing it every once in a while. Yeah. And then one day I had the idea where I was like, Hey, I could like reboot this as a stop motion pop the project because yep. the dragons are like surprisingly easy to pose. Yep. And so I was like, do you could I, could I have the dragons so I could shoot because it was they were his toys. Yep. I owned the lizardmen, he owned the dragons. So we were in high school at this point. We went to the same high school, and I was like, do you still have the dragons, and can I have them to do a stop motion project? And it was like. It was like a secret teenage drug deal. They like had the same <laughs> talent. You brought them in in a plastic bag, and you pulled them out of your backpack, and you hand them over, and you were like, no one can see me with these. <laughs> so, I, I had a reputation I need to keep up as a band kid. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. Years later, it turns out... Oh, man. 
we still got all of them. Um, oh no. Yeah, it doesn't work. Very, but there's a screw on the bottom, so I think you can. His belly used to light up. Yeah. Especially he, when you put his head. He had like a, a Nord. Yeah. Nordic. The wings are gone. Yep. But yep. I went on eBay like an hour ago and I found like a listing that was just all the wings. So I, I'm gonna have the wings. You're gonna have the wings. But look how poseable they are. We yeah, can I mean, like a, they can move their heads, they can wave. Imagine like a nine-year-old getting this for like a Christmas present. Yeah, this would have blown your mind. Yeah, you and, and of course, the moment I saw something like this, I'd immediately be like, hey, we're making a fucking movie, you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, we have, you gotta recreate that epic shot. I am a vegetarian now. <laughs> <laughs> I will not eat the audience. <laughs> it, was, it was really I more eating the camera. Articles. <laughs> I, I hope you guys are all... Oh man, the, my lip sync doesn't die good. The Dragons reboot by Disney is looking really weird. <laughs> what is his name? Ironclad? Uh, yeah, yeah. Ironclad. I am Ironclad. I am endorsing Bernie Sanders for President of the United States. Yeah, be careful about that <laughs> one, sir. <laughs> we gotta... We gotta... We need a revolution in this country. Lizardmen's, dragons, humans, all bounding together to change the world. <laughs> Remember the voice. Come on, you got this. I'm yep, yep, Ice yep. Rocks. <laughs> Sorry for any offense. I have no, no idea where any of the lizard men are, but I don't care. <laughs> yeah, that's, just find some Star Wars models online or something. That's it! I can't take this anymore! I'm going on strike! <laughs> Alright, and so now we're going to look at some things I made in high school, which are sort of mixed. Some of these things I'm proud of, some of them I think are just weird, and we're going to take a glance at a couple things. This segment might be a little rambly, because I literally don't have a script, I just know what I want to look at, and I sort of want to capture my live reactions to viewing these old things again. I think this works because the general vibe of this video is that it's like we're hanging out and we're just checking out some of my old stuff. I also want to publicly admit that um, uh, the day I'm recording this is the 28th and I'm contractually obligated to have this out the 29th, so if the video seems a little rushed, that's probably why. My high school had this really cool in-school media program which would have students create original videos and original productions, be it skits, or newsreels describing events going on at school, and then every month they would compile these into one broadcast which would be aired throughout the school. We called this Channel 4. From the moment you entered the school as a freshman, the idea of being featured on Channel 4 or involved in Channel 4 was heavily coveted. I remember sitting in class and watching the screen as it showed recordings of our pep rallies, just scanning the crowds looking for like the tiniest pixel that I knew represented my head. And it was finally during my first term, I think as a junior, that I was given a chance to be involved in Channel 4 and to create a skit which was entirely standalone that was basically entirely about me. An elephant in the room we haven't addressed during this video is that uh, when I was a kid, I looked like a girl. I got bullied pretty heavily over this, but I got revenge in the end by hitting puberty harder and faster than anyone else in my class. Anyways, the point of the story is that by the time I was in high school, I was a very large dude. I, I was super tall, you know, I had broad shoulders. I was overweight, let's just say it. And uh, I didn't play any sports. And... This really bothered people. And the reason I didn't play sports is just because I wasn't interested, and also because the sport everyone wanted me to play was football, and I like my brain working. So anyways, yeah, I wasn't in media, but these kids in media that I knew were like, we're gonna make a whole series of videos about the fact that you don't play sports. And that's what we're gonna watch right now. What if Q played sports? So Q, I wonder why Q doesn't play any sports, like track or cross country. Yeah, they really should. The track team isn't looking that good. Dude, Q, what's up? Why don't you run track this year? We really need you. I love the R I'm giving off in this scene. Like, I just have chosen not to contribute anything. I'm like a genie in like an old sitcom. Like, we've entered a dream sequence. He's offering me his sportsmanship, and I'm denying it. 
I don't even need the the head start. I can just I can I can do it on my own. Look at that! Look at that boy run. And I think my heart explodes here. I've fallen and I can't get up. Uh, so a little piece of context is um, we had a film teacher that taught like film theory at the high school. And his name was Mr. Roof. He's one of my favorite people in the world. And he was obsessed, he was and is obsessed with Christ figure imagery and movies. And so anyone that took a film class with him, like had a running joke, or when, when we would then create our own films, we would put ridiculous Christ figure imagery into our own works. And that's why I'm doing like an obvious Christ pose here. I think it was a semester or two after that that I officially got into the media class and I was able to create my own things instead of simply working on someone else's projects. Uh, if you ever saw the Internet Historian collab that I did with him, that's how Quentin Leap came into existence. Uh, but I want to stop real quick and tell a little bit of a funny story that I remember today. Alongside Channel 4, media also did something called the Afternoon Announcements basically every single day. And this was a video broadcast we would do live, basically listing off any updates about the school that students might need to know. This could be something as simple as bus 15 is now bus 42, uh, it, but it usually just tended to involve things like clubs and upcoming events. Out of all the jobs you could do on the afternoon announcements, my favorite one was designing the PDF that would actually show you all the text and images representing whatever was being talked about. The reason I like doing this is because I got to insert a bit of humor into each slide. Like if this one was about the ACT, I could show a, a picture of that popcorn that says ACT on the front. Anyways, like a year into me doing this constantly, one of the announcements that we have to report on is that the Harry Potter Alliance is doing something, like they're meeting in this club room, or, you know, the club dues are in, whatever. And so I make the PDF doc, and I put up an image of the cast of Twilight. I did not foresee how mad that would make them. The way they responded, you would think that I had made fun of their dead mother live on the air. And they marched down to the media room, and they waited the teacher was very busy, talking to like 20 people. They waited like half an hour just to like confront someone about the disrespect to their organization because someone had put up a picture of Twilight. Mr. Cooley was the teacher at this point and he said, Quentin, for now on, you know, when it comes to the Harry Potter Alliance, those guys, you know, they got a lot of power and they get really mad. So, you know, if it's an announcement for them, put up a picture from Harry Potter. So the next day, I put up a picture of Cedric Diggory, and I was not allowed to work on the afternoon announcements ever again. With that, I think it's time that we talk about the most important thing that you could do as a part of the Channel 4 team. That being Prom Promise. Prom Promise was an annual thing that our school put together, essentially encouraging students to be careful around prom night because, you know, every few years there would be a car accident or an overdose on prom. And basically the, the teachers and the principals wanted us all to remind the students to be careful with a sort of cautionary tale, a short film about how things on prom night can go really, really badly. Every prom promise was the same. You'd see a scene of a group of students at the high school excited about prom, the, the movie would skip over prom because it was filmed before prom happened. Dude, prom was, prom was a great time. Oh my god, prom was so much fun. Prom was nasty, man. For real, prom was so tight, though. No, man, good time. It was a good time. Let's go. Good time, man. It was hot. And then you would see a series of prom after parties, which would all end in some sort of tragedy. Trevor! 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 Trevor, wake up! Someone help me! Trevor's not waking up! Give him some water, he'll be all right. Good. Have any of you all not drank? The problem with Prom Promise, to me at least, was that it never actually introduced you to any of the characters in any way that was memorable or interesting. 
it would presume that you were a senior at the high school and that you knew the popular kids and thus that you were invested in the question of if one of the popular kids was going to die or was going to go to jail or was going to get pregnant. And so the basic setup of a scene would be you see a bunch of kids at a party or something, something happens that might make you emotional, and then sad music plays. Just the students like look up popular sad songs and then play them over scenes which they hope come across as sad. My life will never be the same because of the decision I made that night. And I swear to God, every single year, the one song they would always pick at least once was Hurt by Johnny Cash. And every time it happened, I started taking that song a little less seriously. And you could have it all. Prom was supposed to be a night we wanted to remember. Now it's a night we wish we could forget. And you... Basically by the time it got to the point that like my senior year was putting together our own prom promise, we all agreed that we hated prom promises. We hated everything they represented during our first three years at the school. And we basically decided we wanted to make the anti-prom promise. For better or for worse, it was like the opposite of what every prom promise had been before. And the main difference to us was that we didn't want to have this huge cast of characters that just get knocked over like dominoes. We decided to focus on a select few characters. And did that make a good movie? Arguably no, but it made like a movie that's easier to talk about, I feel. Alright, I'm finally ready to watch this. Uh, I'm really nervous because it's been five years since I made this, it's been five years since I graduated, and I'm really worried that it's going to be absolutely unbearably bad, and I'm going to be really embarrassed by it. But the good news is that this Prom Promise uh, was very much a collaborative effort. It wasn't just my movie. I mean, we had two directors, we had like ten people working on the scripts and the concepts. So if there's anything in the movie I don't really like, I just won't take credit for it. So this movie might be unbearably horrible, but I'm really proud of what I did with the first 45 seconds. Tonight, I'm gonna have myself a real good time, I feel alive, and the world, I'll turn it inside out, yeah. I'm floating around in ecstasy. I actually am I actually am having a good time. This is great. To to be fair though, that's a little bit cheating. If you put queen over something, it's gonna seem like it's fun. Oh, uh, this is the staircase shot. I love this shot. Ah, look at that. We didn't have a stabilizer or anything, so it kinda looks bad. Yeah, the whole pitch of this scene is uh our main character's name John, and uh he is getting hyped up because he wants to ask the girl of his dreams to prom. So next we're introduced to our two female leads. Uh, Ellen, who is the childhood best friend of John, and J the girl of John's dream, who in the script was only referred to as BG, which stood for bitch girl, 
And I was like, guys, she has to have a name. And so I named her Brittany, Brittany Georgia. It turned out during production that I was not good at writing teenagers, so uh, I was not allowed to touch the script. And the dialogue in this, I think, gets pretty bad, which is funny considering how worse my dialogue must have been. But one of my only contributions was the fact that at some stage in the scripting process, none of the characters had names. And then, like, in the middle of the night, I thought up a bunch of names for all of them. And they were all based on stupid inside jokes. Like, I thought it would be funny if we had a character named Eleanor Lane, like a combination of Eleanor Rigby and Penny Lane. And then I thought it'd be funny if we had a character named Joe Say, like Josie and the Pussycats. I, 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 hadn't, I had not slept in days, okay? <laughs> and so throughout this whole movie, all the characters exclusively will use their first names because their full names are like dumb jokes that the audience would groan at if they actually heard them out loud. <laughs> so John's best friend, Ellen, is taking BG to his promposal. He's going to ask her to prom. And when he does this, she reacts very negatively, almost in complete disgust. This is a weird thing to argue, uh, but I think potentially Austin was the incorrect person to put into the role of John because he is probably the most attractive guy I've ever met. Like, he is very conventionally attractive. He's got, like, a chiseled chin. Whenever I hang out with him, he, like, he gets hit on all the time. So the idea of him being, like, an incel kind of dude doesn't make sense. I do like this sharp cut here him moments away from getting rejected, and then him depressed out of his mind at Waffle House. Waffle House is like a great place to film, and this scene is kind of pointless. You could cut it out of the movie, but visually, I just like filming in Waffle Houses. Like, they're so pretty, and the car lights are going off in the background. Anyways, the whole point of this scene is that John is venting about the fact that he got rejected during this promposal, and Ellen, is dropping very subtle hints that she is secretly madly in love with him. You're a really great guy. I'm sure you can find someone. Uh, yeah, like who? I don't know. Maybe someone you wouldn't expect? I don't know where I would even begin to look for someone else. Probably wouldn't have to look very far at all. It's just... I've been in love with her for as long as I can remember. Is this a Disney Channel original movie? <laughs> so John is still convinced that he has a shot to take BG to prom, and then we sharp cut to a classroom where she's getting asked out by, you know, two characters. Uh, see if you can tell the moment where our teacher stepped in and changed the editing of the movie. Oh, there you go. Bump hips, bump butt, bump hips. Oh, something's cut out here, and now they're walking away. <laughs> hey, Ellen. Be excellent if you want some problem with me. Uh, yeah, sure. I'd love to. So Jacob, my dear friend who randomly stopped talking to me like three months ago, uh, he throws a ditch prom party with all these other attractive guys that should have no reason not to go to prom. And meanwhile, our friend, Jose, has another party with uh, all the kids that did go to prom, which gets dangerous and off the hook. Oh, did you see that? That was my cameo. The, the curled up hairy arm, which is distinctively mine. That's... that's my cameo. Also, um, you might be wondering, Quentin, how did you film this party and get all these great actors to look like they were getting drunk and high? Um, the answer is, uh, we had a bunch of friends over at some guy's house and they all got drunk and high and then we filmed it. I don't know though, isn't there something so funny about making a anti-alcohol PSA video for a high school and everyone getting drunk on set? So, my favorite animal is definitely gotta be an owl. Okay, yeah, explain. I mean, do you not know? No, 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 no. Everybody, I don't give these just anybody. But I'm gonna need you to take a bag with you. I've had ten already. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. You got okay. Now, delicious. 
this bagel chip represents my body. Uh, so I played that clip because it's the last fun thing that happens in this prom promise. Uh, it's also pretty much the last thing I worked on because I really didn't approve of the rest of the movie. I should put in like a content like trigger warning here. If you have any like traumas or triggers related to uh, sexual abuse, you should probably skip like five minutes in. Uh, and even if you don't, like I don't, I don't like this part of the movie. There was this weird thing that happened the first day that we were planning this, where we all got together and we all had like passionate ideas about what we wanted to bring to the table for this movie. And I was going on about how we need to like develop these characters and have scenes just exploring them and giving them depth beyond just being recognizable people in the school. And tr you know, to try and get you invested in their lives so when something bad happens you care. And then Robert, the other director of the movie, he said, uh, we should have the female lead get sexually assaulted. And I was like, that doesn't sound like a good idea. And I didn't even like fight it that hard because I kind of presumed that the school would not let us do that. But it turns out we, we could have done anything we wanted. We don't show anything. We show the, the main female lead ending up like drunk and alone at a party and her getting like dragged off out of scene into a closed room. And then we just see like a visceral upsetting phone call between uh, her and John, which is acted so well that it's, I can't watch it. I've realized recently when I mute the scene, you can tell what's happening and it's still really upsetting. So I often think we should have just had the scene play with no audio. You know, me, Austin, and Robert, we, we weren't that close before we made the movie, and by the time it was over, we were, we were kind of like friends for life. And anytime all three of us are in town, we make sure to meet up and catch up. And you know, we had this interesting conversation where he talked about the fact that he regrets doing that storyline because he feels like in an era of Me Too, it's really important for victims to tell those stories and not like, you know, three 18-year-old white dudes. And this weird thing happened where I suddenly found myself defending the storyline. Like, in five years, we had totally switched positions on this. Because my argument was that our senior class, especially, was filled to the brim with this hyper-masculine attitude about, like, the survivors of abuse. Very much the he said, she said argument, where things would happen at the school that were really messed up, and they would sort of shrug and say, hey, it's not my place, why would I care? And when you saw those dudes in the hall after the movie was done, they were as pale as a ghost. It was like it was the first time they'd actually thought about what it would be like to go through something like that. And so I, I think it was good, not that we made that storyline, but that we made some chuds, like, think about how bad assault would be. After the phone call, John freaks out. He realizes he has to go find Ellen, even though he's super drunk. And he gets his keys back and he drives out of the garage, and you can tell he's just, like, not, he's, he's not fully conscious of what's going on, and he's just struggling to drive. And then, of course, as happens in every prom promise, there is an accident. And, you know, we cut the black, and for a few moments you think, like, oh my god, that guy is dead now. And instead of that, we fade up on, on this scene of him in bed and he's crippled below the waist. A single tear drops down his cheek, and, and Alan is next to them. This is where the movie ends. That's it. Just these people's lives are ruined, and we don't have anything else to say about it. And you could have it all. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now that we've all collectively gone back and rediscovered all of my lost early work, I think we can all agree I should stick to my day job. Fallen Titans is a series I have a weird relationship with. I feel like when I started it, I had a very specific opinion about what was important in being a YouTuber, and what I wanted to accomplish by being on the site. 
But as time has gone on, I've just really become a completely different person. And I... I've grown sort of bitter about the fact that it seems like... It seems as if Fallen Titans is my flagship series. I've often recently felt that when I'm not doing Fallen Titans, uh, the channel just isn't performing well. And I'm not really making a steady income. And that's made me very bitter and cynical about the whole concept behind the series. And I've often fantasized about a day where I could... a day where I could quit. Where I could just stop doing Fallen Titans altogether. But sometimes you end up finding out... When you think something's broken... It just needs to be recharged. A big shout out to the sponsor of today's video, Privacy.com. If you've been watching this channel for any time, long or short, Privacy.com is a name you've heard before. And I want to promise you guys, when I continue to do a sponsor over and over again repeatedly, it's because it's a product or service that I actually respect and actively use. So let it be known that it's not an exaggeration when I say that Privacy.com is an incredible service and that I use it almost every single day. With Privacy, you can create virtual burner cards that act as a sort of middleman between you and the active thieves and trolls of the internet. It's so easy to use, you just make an account, connect that to your bank, and bang, you're ready to be secure anywhere you go online. Someone in my private Discord group told me this great story, where they were browsing the internet and they got one of those ads that was like, you can come and get this product entirely for free, but when they went to the form, they asked for a card, which obviously made it seem like a scam. So what they ended up doing was, they went to privacy, they made a card with a $1 limit that could only be used once, and then they put that into the website. And of course, the moment that they finished filling out the form, the website tried to charge them for a hundred dollars. And the great thing about that story is that if that website has pocketed that card info and is intent on selling it or reusing it in any further cases, it just won't work. It's entirely useless to them. But I've also realized recently one of the greatest features is that it's connected directly to your bank. It's not going through your debit card. So whenever my debit card is acting wonky and is just randomly not working on a website or something like that, I realize I can just go in and use my privacy card and it usually works. For instance, about a week ago I wanted to order a Blu-ray of the Super Dimension Fortress Macross Do You Remember Love, which was one of my favorite movies as a kid that I recently rediscovered when shuttling through these old VHS tapes. But the problem is that the Super Dimension Fortress Macross Do You Remember Love is sold exclusively in Japan because of Harmony Gold. And the Blu-ray doesn't have any English dubs or subtitles, but I I've seen it so many times that I kind of know what everyone is saying. The point is that I had to go to a Japanese website to buy this thing, and every time I you try to buy something on a website not based in America, my bank just freaks out and freezes my card. But I was able to use privacy as a backup, and I got to order it anyways, as you can tell by the fact that it's in my hand. But yeah, use privacy.com to buy yourself a lot of anime. That's my pitch. Additionally, if you really like the service, consider signing up to Privacy's Pro and Team accounts. With Pro, you get 36 cards a month and 1% cash back on all your purchases, and with Teams, you get 60 cards a month and a personal manager who helps keep your account secure. But remember, you can still use the free version of the service, which will get you 12 cards a month without you spending a single penny. And you can check all this out at privacy.com slash Quentin. If you go right now, you're going to get $5 credited to your account entirely for free. That's $5 you can spend anywhere you'd like, whether you want to pick up a Macross Blu-ray, or you want to donate to my Patreon, or you want to buy one of these dragons on eBay. You can do whatever you want. That's $5 to spend anywhere you want on the internet. Once again, that's privacy.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. While I was writing this script, uh, I was using Google Docs, and somehow uh, one of the people that did a hit piece on me all those years ago, he got sent the script. 
and he started leaving a lot of like really weird comments all over the script and we were just all really bemused and just making fun of it because they were all things like but what did you learn, Quentin? How did you change? How did it all make you a better person? How are you not the same person you were back then? And I was just like laughing at it because I was like, what the fuck, man? Like all that drama happens and you expect to come in here and you think I'm going to be talking about it like it was a magic school bus episode? Hey, Quentin, what do you say? We all want to know what you learned today. Uh, YouTube friendships aren't real. They don't see you as human beings. They see you as a commodity to be used to further their careers. The moment they no longer see you as that, they will stop talking to you. Never interact with a bad faith mob. They hate you by default. They will go out of their way to twist your words out of context and try and make you have a mental breakdown because it makes their cause better. Uh, uh, drugs are cool. I'll always say yes to... Do a lot of drugs. Go ahead and go to that box to the left. You're going to give this video five stars. Hit that like button. Click subscribe. We're trying to get to 350,000 subscribers by 2029. Uh, leave a comment below about what you think the moral of this video was. Because, God, I clearly don't know. Um, uh, all right, that's it. Video over. Here's more footage of me as a baby. Well, we got a rabbit now. We're hugging our rabbit now. We're tired of our rabbit, aren't we? Already tired of it. We're gonna throw it on the floor. There he goes. I bet you're tired, but we're not done with you yet. I'm getting tired, Daddy. I'm getting tired. Oh. Alright. That might be a little bit too close. Look at what we're doing to the little rabbit. They're <laughs> just throwing that rabbit everywhere. Um, it's my rabbit, Daddy. I can throw it if I like. Yeah, it got me. Yeah, it got me. <laughs>